and cool. off we go. Yes, Great. we will be providing the recording. It takes about a week to get up on the NDC site, but your cohort leads will tell you how to get that. Cool. Well, thanks for the handoff, Tara. So I'm Dave Mangum. I'm a partner in Dorsey's corporate group in the Denver office, and we're joined by my colleague, Mike Weiner. Mike and I work together a lot. We actually also teach a venture capital contract class at the law school, so we have a lot of a, a kind of history with CU. I actually ran and it, so I feel kind of dated here. I ran the new venture challenge back in 2012 and was involved in it in law school. So it's great to see how much it's grown. I think when I ran it, it was probably 15 or 16 companies with a fraction of the dollars that are now available. So it's uh, great to see the progress made in the program and we're certainly happy to be helping here. So um, I think given that we only have about 10 minutes for kind of content plus some questions, I want to make just, I want to make sure we kind of just jump into stuff. So what Mike and I do, we're corporate lawyers. So we help startups actually form a business and really get started, right? The, for, our, uh, for the 10 minutes we've got, we'll talk a little bit about just some corporate law basics that are important for you to know kind of as a general background. Some of this stuff is not gonna be directly relevant to the new venture challenge, but it'll become relevant very quickly if you actually form a business and really go run this thing and try and make a go of it. So kind of try to hit the hybrid of some of the basic things you want to have in your founders agreement for purposes of the NBC. We'll also talk about just more broadly, some of the basic things you want to be thinking about when you're starting a business together. So Chris, if you can go to the next slide. So the basic concept, when you start a company, it's not just it, in a certain sense, it is just you and your co-founders, but legally speaking, you want to run your business through what's called a legal entity. So there's this question of when do you actually form a company to run your, to, to actually put your business into? And typically there's different reasons why you want to have a company put in place, but a couple of key concepts. If you're creating intellectual property and a bit later in the, uh, the session tonight, we'll talk about that, but when you're going to create intellectual property, when you're going to enter into an agreement with a third party, so you know a customer, certainly an investor, um, when you're going to sign an agreement, uh, or for that matter, when you're going to participate in an accelerator, there's Techstars, there's Boomtown, there's a million of them out there these days. When you're going to do something that might expose you to liability, so what does that mean? If you're going to sell something to somebody that maybe exposes you to some risk. Maybe it's a product that injures somebody and you might get sued for it. Or if you're signing up for some kind of a financial commitment. Um, so, it's a, so it can be financial liability. It can be kind of risks of any general sense. What, the simplest way of saying this is that when you're gonna conduct business with a third party in any sense, you wanna form a company. That protects you from uh, personal liability. And um, <laughs> So without getting too far into the weeds on this, you form a company to protect yourself and to protect your co-founders uh, so that when you're doing business with your investors or your customers, or when you're creating value that you wanna protect, the company owns it. I kinda like to think of a company as a box that you put stuff into that has value and is kind of protecting you personally from any kind of problems that the business might create. I'll just pause there, Mike. Would you add anything else to that? Yeah, essentially, the the life of your company is just spent collecting assets into that box and protecting you, the individuals, the stockholders, uh, from liability for uh, any li any liability goes in uh, into that box as well. So it's a matter of collecting assets and liabilities, uh, just like accounting. Yeah. So it's sort of like if you're going to sell anything or commit to do anything with somebody, you want to form a company. Um, I did see one chat, at least it was maybe direct to me, but a question was, does marketing count as the kind of activity that you want to form a company for? If literally all you're doing is just, you know, kind of putting up a wireframe on the internet that you're not actually selling, that no one can actually buy, probably not as much of a concern. But when you're actually going to sign up for something like, wow, they're giving us money or wow, we're actually going to commit to deliver something to somebody. That's where you want to form a company. So there's a couple of different kinds of legal entities that you typically see when you start a business. 
Um, and we don't want to get too far in the weeds on this again, but some of the ideas that inform this, there's there's tax treatment that can affect one entity versus another. There's other kinds of considerations you'll make. For simplicity purposes, the two basic kinds of entities you're most commonly going to see in your startup career are going to be corporations and what are called LLCs. In certain respects, they achieve the same purpose. And one of the most important things, as I've said before, is they protect you from certain kinds of personal liability. So both a corporation and an LLC will, will in certain ways, protect the owners from personal liability if the business does something that leads to a problem or a lawsuit. Um, but the, the inquiry doesn't end there. So uh, let's see, Chris, if you can go to the next slide, actually. So for any of you who are thinking, wow, I'm actually making a lot of progress on my business. I want to raise real money really quickly. I think I want to be a true startup that's raised money from angel investors or from professional investors. You'll probably pretty quickly be what's called a C corporation. So a corporation is something you create. Uh, you typically want to work with a lawyer to help you on that. You don't technically need to, but it's typically advisable. You form a corporation right out of the gate when you expect that you're going to raise money pretty quickly. Um, most There's always exceptions, but generally speaking, a venture capital fund who invests in startups will typically require that you be a corporation to invest in you. There's lots of flexibility for how you set a company up in terms of the details, but you think of ownership of a company or at least uh, the ownership of a corporation is in stock. If you own stock, you are an owner of a corporation. Um, and it's again, it's pretty typically what you see. Lots of companies out there are uh, corporations in the startup world. Uh, Mike, would you have anything else to that? Yeah, typically on the public markets, those are all C corps. Um, and uh, for private companies, uh, almost every uh, VC backed company is also a C corp. Um, and for the most part, VCs will make you go into being a corp. Um, yeah. Early, and, and I'm, I just did one today. We just converted an LLC into a corp because the investors made us. Yeah, and it's pretty, and I, I got a direct message. That's a pretty easy conversion. We can talk about that later. But just because we have such limited time, I'll jump now to LLCs. <clears throat> so an LLC, it achieves some of the same functions that a corporation does. It protects the founders from personal liability. The main distinction that is worth keeping in mind is that an LLC is, in some respects, it has more favorable tax treatment. You're not going to have some of the same. In a corporation, you have what's called double tax. The corporation has tax on its income, and the shareholders who own the corporation have tax if and when the corporation distributes money to the shareholders. In an LLC, it's just one layer of tax. So it's tax advantaged in that sense. Lots of startups start out as LLCs because in some respects, they're pretty easy to form and they have this favorable tax treatment. Um, and then you can always convert to a corporation later if you need to. We see a lot, especially in Colorado, we see a lot of startups start as LLCs, which um, in some respects makes a lot of sense for tax, if nothing else, and then eventually convert to a corporation. Um, I think uh, that's kind of a sort of at a high level for purposes of moving quickly. That's probably the, the one thing I would, I would add there, Dave, is that although it's tax advantage, the way it's tax advantage is an LLC is that you, the owners of the LLC, you pay the tax. All the income and the losses essentially are distributed to you. Um, maybe not the cash, but the income is to you and you have to pay tax. So, for instance, one caveat that we've had to make is many of our, um, Dave and I actually do a lot of cannabis work and many of our cannabis clients are now C-Corps, not because they don't like the tax advantages of pass-through, but because um, they were having significant, significant tax issues every time the government audited the company. So they have now converted to tax or um, corp for a less ta favorable tax treatment to avoid a surprise um, tax audit. Yeah. So, um, Tara, I actually have lost track of time this time. How are we doing on time? You're good. You're right at about 10 minutes. Okay. So just with a couple minutes left, I'll give you a 
couple other quick points of background. As you can imagine, so we can spend hours talking about this stuff and frequently with clients, we often do. So it's just kind of a high level primer uh, background thing. Two other things to be aware of, one of which is just the kind of the closing point on some legal stuff. Then we'll talk about founder agreements. So um, we've talked about entities. You form entities to start your businesses. They protect you from liability. Um, there's other subsets of companies you can choose. There's what's called, if you go to the next slide, Chris, there's what's called uh, a B corporation. Those are a relatively new development. There's also an LLC version of that called the, I think it's the L3C. Candidly, we see them you know, from time to time. Most startups don't, at least, I'll put it this way. They're becoming increasingly common, but lots of startups are still opting for the more conventional C-Corp or LLC approach. So the gist on that is that they're, those are entities that can have a sort of a social impact component to the business formation. But to get into the bigger detail there would take a bit too much time. So those are two other kind of versions that are available to you, an L3C and a B Corp. Most of my day job is not dealing with those. It tends to be more LLCs and corporations. So we've given you some general kind of fire hose background on entities. Founder agreements are a big part of all of this. And there's different things that you will do when you actually set the company up. But to focus this for new venture challenge purposes, and Tara can kind of double down here if necessary. But And think of this uh, founder's agreement for the NVC as kind of a simplified version of what you would really do in greater detail if you were doing this kind of uh, out there in the real world, so to speak, and were uh, you know, working with a lawyer to put this together. But basically the NVC version of this is the founder's agreement needs to say the name of your company. You need to name all the team members who are on the team and also saying what role they have. Um, you need to, and important here, you need to be clear what your basic plan is to disseminate the winnings if you get any. And this doesn't need to be two pages long, but some agreed upon plan that says, if we get money, here's how we're gonna spend it in some basic sense. And you want all the team members to sign. The idea here is you want some agreement of the team regarding how you're gonna do this. To be clear, you don't need to form a legal entity to do this. This is just for NBC purposes. We want something that spells out these really basic parameters. Um, in the real world, so to speak, the founder's agreement is kind of not the term of art we would use there is there's other kinds of contracts you'd put in place to actually form the company legally. So we want to draw a distinction there. But for NBC purposes, these are some of the things you need. Or these are the things you have to have in the agreement. Would you have anything else to that? And I would add to that where we talk about the roles of all the team members, I would go beyond just the title and one or two bullets about what it is that members expected to do, and also have an idea of how much time everybody's going to spend, especially for a student organization. Um, you, you might have a team member who already knows that they can't work for three weeks because they have a project due. Um, you want to actually discuss that and, and whether that makes a difference. Um, it's one of the things in the real world that we also get frustrated with. Uh, our companies form, they hire some advisor, they don't tell them how much they're expected to do. And then six months later, they're calling us and saying, I wanna get rid of them, I wanna, get, I wanna pull back their stock, what do I do? It's really hard if you haven't been very careful about telling folks what you expect of them. Yeah. You expect so them to work four hours a week or 10 hours or whatever it is. So role is not just a title. It's not just developer. It's I'm going to code the software and I'll work at least X hours per week on it, roughly. Some kind of clarity around what the expectations are for what each person's going to do. Let's see. So I saw one question here. Uh, yeah, so voting. How does voting work? That's a good question. Um, you know, in a certain sense, when you actually form a company, voting is largely, it, it is driven by ownership of the business. So to use a really easy example, this would be true whether it's an LLC or a corporation. Say it's three founders, each of whom owns one third of the company. You'll typically say that voting decisions are made by a majority vote. So in a three person company where each person owns one third, technically speaking, that typically means two of the three founders uh, essentially have the vote to determine 
important things that the owners need to vote on. You can have different standards that are more than majority, but typically or at the early stages, you don't necessarily want to make it complicated. Majority vote is the typical approach. So that was uh, uh, Jan's question, but that's kind of the, the concept is it's determined by ownership. And, and in that context, watch out for agreeing on unanimity. We get very nervous when we see unanimity, um, especially if you have maybe a core group and a less core group. Um, if you say every decision is unanimous, that means you can be held hostage um, uh, for the one person who's really not pulling their weight uh, can really cause a lot of problems, um, which leads to uh, uh, somebody's asking about vesting uh, in the chat room. Um, vesting is a really important co uh, concept it, uh, in the real world, it may be a little harder to put together in this. Um, um, in the NBC. In, yeah, in this contest. But essentially, the concept is earning your stock through service over a period of time or your equity through a period of time. So typically, when we set up a company, we'll say the founders are get all their equity today, but they're going to earn it over four years. And if they leave or if they're fired or God forbid they die, um, some of that equity will come back to the company. Um, and that's really important because in any group of three or more founders, one of you will leave within two years. Now, it may be a good thing. Uh, I got into med school, I'm moving to uh, uh, Philadelphia to go to uh, Chris and my alma mater, Penn, or um, it might be a bad thing. I just don't like working with you guys anymore and I wanna quit, or that you're firing me for that reason. Um, so vesting handles all of that because otherwise, if it's Dave, me and Chris, we each own a third, Dave leaves on day two, he still owns a third and Chris and I have to do all the work. And if we have to do uh, three, have or uh, three over two uh, work levels, we're not going to do it, and the company will fall apart. Yeah. Let me uh, let me jump in really quick and say, Jonathan Stokely. I know you've had your hand raised for like fifteen minutes. Uh, jump in if you've got a question. No, Other sorry, that was uh, actually to ask for our recording. I just forgot to. Uh, uh, gotcha, gotcha. My hand. Well, but let's go. This Vesting conversation is exactly, I think, a very good point to talk about. Uh, uh, Tara, could, can we answer another question or are we oh, out of time? Yep. No, we've got uh, maybe one more question. Okay. Satish asks, can you have multiple businesses under one LLC? Um, you can have as many businesses as you want in any corporate entity. Um, uh, obviously, the more you have, the more complicated uh, it is from both a legal liability standpoint, um, in other words, you wouldn't want to have your toxic waste dump uh, in the same business uh, as a florist. Um, toxic waste dump, big liability. Florist, not so much. Um, but also, uh, uh, more importantly, it, it is hard to finance a company that has multiple businesses in one entity, one box, yeah. So you can do it. So, so you can do it, but you typically want to keep it simple. If it's if it's two businesses that are very different, you probably want to form two separate LLCs. If they're two businesses that are really related, one's probably fine. Yeah, um, it, we've run into this many times where we end up having to spin out um, a business because one business is exciting and people want to invest, and another business is not. I have a client right now that has been in zombie form for over a year because they cannot get the cool, exciting business away from the boring, debt-ridden business. We can't get it out, um, and that's going to be a problem. Thanks for answering all those. I know we didn't get to um, you, Kyle and Rich. Hang on to those, and let's open them up when we go to the panel uh, here in just a little bit. Uh, right now, I'd love to switch over to Chris Ainsco uh, to talk a little bit about IP and patents. Oh, 
All right. Well, welcome everybody and thank you, Tara. Thank you, Mike and Dave for the uh, introduction to uh, the, the corporate world. Um, before I get into the, the heavy legal issues, I thought I'd just um, stop for a moment and share with you all a, a passage from one of my favorite authors, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, that I think will inform the discussion about intellectual property or, or as we call it IP and matter what it is and why you should care about it. And maybe also provide a little bit of motivation as you're going through this you know, maybe arduous, difficult process of, of competing in NBC. So <clears throat> here we go. This is from uh, Self-Reliance. We should learn to detect and watch that gleam of light which flashes across our minds from within. More than the luster of the firmament of bards and sages. Yet we dismiss without notice our thoughts because they are ours. In every work of genius, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. We should abide by our spontaneous impression. Else tomorrow, a stranger will say with masterly good sense, precisely what we have thought and felt all the time and we shall be forced to take with shame our own opinion from another. So that really gets to the, the crux of what intellectual property is all about. It's about recognizing that you've got an idea and you've got something and then doing something about it. Um, another, one of, my, one of our colleagues, Lee Osman, who's, who's an eminence in the patent world, uh, like to sum it up by saying, the person least qualified in a room to say that there's been an invention is usually the person who invented it because there's this, you know, self doubt of whether it, you, what you've thought is, you know, worthwhile. So with that, I will ask who here, you raise your hands either virtually or physically, who here thinks they have a good idea? All right. Got a few hands raised. I would, I would expect so. That's really encouraging. Um, so I will tell you, I mean, stick to your guns. And uh, you know, if you get stuck, ask for help. I, Tara has provided and will continue to provide a bunch of resources for getting help. Um, I myself have signed up as a mentor and some of my other colleagues have signed up as mentors. There's a lot of really good mentors signed up, but you know, keep at it. Um, but who here is also concerned that somebody's gonna steal your idea? Show of hands, yeah, it's a real thing. Um, <laughs> So that's also what intellectual property is all about. So uh, what's the public policy behind IP? Uh, why should you care? And then we'll get to the types. So I'm gonna talk about patents. I'm a patent attorney at Dorsey. And then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Lindsay Sadler, who does uh, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, talk about that. So the public policy behind intellectual property, it's a contract with the government that rewards investment. So what it is, and in fact, even it was Mark Twain it wrote once, he's like, the first thing he would do, um, I think this is a, a Yankee in King Arthur's court, is the first thing you would do in a new country is set up a patent office, right? Because there's no innovation without intellectual property. There's no, um, there wouldn't be any COVID vaccines. There wouldn't be a pharma industry. Nobody would have a cell phone. Um, it really is one of the economic drivers that drives uh, progress in society. And it's the ability to, you know, come up with an idea and use it um, exclusively in, in many cases for your own benefit for um, a limited period of time. Uh, so you all are gonna form companies, maybe you're gonna form companies, maybe you're not, but you're gonna, you're working on a problem and you're gonna find solutions to this problem. So if you develop solutions to the problems and then don't do anything with your IP, the risk you run is that you give that IP away, it becomes publicly available somehow by your use or publishing it or whatever. And then other people use it and are more successful with, at it than you are. That's a problem. Now, if you develop your, your solutions and your IP, then you actually will help your company um, and help its, its long-term longevity. And we, we see this all the time when we work with startups. One of the things they do is they try to um, get their trademarks, patents um, registered so that they can build value and then sell the company. And we see this all the time. Um, so now I'm going to get into patents, which is my specialty, or as I like to call it, you kids get off my lawn. Um, so here's an example of a patent, something that um, I thought was, was really topical. So, if, you know, 
being in the, the pandemic COVID world we're in, but if you still want to date, um, you know, and have a love life, this could be really handy. And I think they were ahead of their time. This was patented in, tw in 2004. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of cool ideas out there. So there's one. Um, patents are based in the U.S. Constitution. It's written right in its Constitution uh, that you shall have the, the right to um, basically to use your inventions for a certain period of time. And there are different types of patents that we'll get into in a, in a minute. But the, the important thing to understand, a lot of people who don't um, are, are new to patents, uh, what you need to understand is that a patent doesn't give you the right to do anything, except maybe crow about the fact that you've got a patent. What it gives you the right to do is to keep the kids off your lawn. It allows you to build a fence, basically, around your invention and keep people out and keep them from practicing copying your invention. So that's an important thing to consider. Um, criteria for patents. Uh, it has to be new, something that's not identical to anything else. It has to be useful, and a pet rock is useful. Uh, pretty much the only thing that's not useful is uh, perpetual motion machines and cold fusion. Um, so pretty much anything is useful. Uh, Non-obvious, can't be the, so if somebody had a uh, patent on a hammer and then you were to come along and be like, I'm going to patent a blue hammer, they would say that's obvious and you're not gonna get a patent on that. Uh, types of patents, they're utility patents. These are probably 85% of the patents that are, are filed and issued are things, they're patents that relate to uh, devices and methods of doing stuff, methods of manufacturing, industrial processes, um, computer methods, things like this. They're design patents that cover aesthetics. So if you remember the big landmark Apple Samsung case a few years ago, that was a design patent that covers the, the iPhone in that case, what the iPhone looks like. And there are plant, and there are plant patents which cover um, plant varieties that have been um, either developed or you know, genetically modified, but not just stuff growing out in nature. Um, so some examples of utility patents. This is, a, if you've got a rodent problem, you, know, you just take your Smith & Wesson revolver and tie a hunk of cheese to it and blam, no more rodent problem. Um, here's, so another thing, you'll notice in the, in the requirements, it, there's no requirement that a patent be a good idea. So it just has to be useful. So if you're like me, you're losing your glasses all the time, here's a simple solution, just pierce them to your face, um, which that will prevent them from being lost, I suppose. Um, this is a handy little time piece. This provides a countdown of the hours, minutes, and seconds you have left to live. Um, so, you know, that's a little cheery, like, oh, I just wasted this much of my life and now I'm here. Um, and another utility patent, we've got the precautionary attachment for bottles containing poison. This is handy in case you don't want to poison your children or, you know, your neighbor's children, things like that. Uh, this is a design patent. Um, this is, you know, an SUV. So what this covers is, again, the aesthetic appearance of, of the, uh, this SUV. Uh, the, the dashed out pieces like the wheels and the mirrors are things that aren't part of the, the patent, aren't part of the patent, but what they're trying to cover here is the glass and the body panels. And so that's what a design patent looks like. And with that, I've finished two minutes ahead of time. So now I have more time for questions. Yeah, there were a couple on the chat, Chris, you may wanna answer those. Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, read them out for you if that's a little easier. First of all, most important, um, uh, Rich Turner would really like you to share your Emerson quote. He absolutely- Oh yeah, sure. I, yeah, so it wasn't so. quite a quote. I was, I, I was um, paraphrasing because it, it actually said a man should. And I was like, well, that's not really PC for these days. So, but I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, what I'll do is I'll stick it, I'll, I'll stick it in the notes for the uh, slides that we send out because we are going to send the slides out, but I'll, uh, I'll put a citation in there for it. And then um, Liju is asking, and feel free, uh, I, Omar, I'll get to you in one second. Feel free to put your hands up if you want to ask the questions live, which I totally encourage. Um, but uh, Liju wants to know, are patents worth it if you're a tech company? You know, there's, so, there's lots of uh, copying going out on, on different things in the industry. Yeah, so, so there, are, there are some things in the tech industry that are, are more difficult to patent these days due to a series of Supreme Court decisions. But I will say, if your idea is patent, what's ca called patent eligible, um, and there are certain business methods, things that aren't, but if you're doing software, I mean, really, if you're doing anything that's inventive and you, you think you're going to be able to make money at it, and it's, and it's the kind of thing that can be patented, it's worth at least trying to figure out whether you can get a patent on it. Because if you don't, anybody else can come up and buy it and do it better possibly. 
Hey, Chris, um, can, can we yeah. weigh in here on that? Because uh, we get this question a lot um, about uh, uh, patents uh, in the emerging company side. Um, and putting aside the actual utility of the patent, it is often very helpful when you go to get financing or to sell the company to say, I have proprietary technology and here's my patents, here's my trademarks, here's my whatever it is. And um, uh, therefore I have some protectable areas. And uh, when people don't get those patents, often the first question is not a compliment about how much money you saved, but where are your patents? What is protectable? Or can other people just come along and copy you? Uh, yeah, so think, we get that a lot. Yeah, thank you, Mike, for that. That's huge. And that that's, goes, goes right into what I said with people when we work with startups and they have their IPO lined up in a row and um, UVC comes in and wants to buy the company um, or invest in the company. That's one of the things they look at when they do their due diligence. And um, is and it may not even be a patent granted, maybe a patent pending, which is different. So you apply for a patent and it doesn't give you any rights until and an if it's granted by the patent office. Um, but it's a really useful tool for building value. How many um, of you, uh, just to raise a hand, have filed a patent before, if anyone? You got a few. Oh, okay. I have. That's yes, I hundred. figured you, you had, Chris. <laughs> and then uh, Mona has another question. Um, what about content on a website? Uh, content on a website, I think we'll let Lindsay handle that when we get to trademark. Um, that's not usually subject to patent ability. Um, I do have see Michaela is asking for utility patent, how can you prove your service method is new, useful, and non-obvious? That's a great question. And it's the same for any kind of uh, patent. And what they do is when you file the application, uh, it goes through a process called examination. And what happens is the patent office will sign an examiner and you have the same examiner for the entire uh, life of the, of the prosecution. We call it prosecution. It's not like prosecution, like for drunk driving, it's a different kind of prosecution. Um, but you have the same examiner through that entire time. And what they do is they will look to see um, if your, your claims are in the right order, if, if they're written correctly, if the application is written correctly, if some, and they'll, they'll actually do a search to find other things that may have been done before that would make your patent uh, not novel or not obvious. Um, like I said, the utility bar is really easy to get over. Like almost anything is useful, um, but that's how they'll do it. They'll, you'll work with an examiner and you'll, you know, you, you or your, or your attorney will go back and forth with the examiner a, a number of times until hopefully you arrive on claims that they consider to be uh, patent patentable. Omar, do you want to uh, take yourself off mute and ask your question? Yeah, um, I was wondering a little bit more. Um, I'm not I'm not exactly sure if this falls under utility patents, but for um, software tools that are meant as general utilities that have like a specific pipeline of functionality. Um, or you know, provide something that's a new, unique set of features. How do you kind of protect that under patent law, if if possible? Um, if not, what other avenues would you pursue? So it's a really good question, and it turns out you can actually you can pursue uh, software patents uh, protection under under patent law, which you don't you're not going to put the source code in the patent, but you're going to uh, put it in the structure of how the software works. And like I said, it's gotten more difficult in recent years, but you still can. And it actually, the pendulum is swinging back the other way to make it more easy, easier uh, to get a software patent. So you can protect it with patents, but you can also protect it with uh, trademark, or sorry, with copyright and trade secret, which Lindsay is going to talk about, which are also really effective ways to to protect your um, your software. Uh, one or two on more in here. Yeah, so Owen's asking, how do you begin the process? Um, what is the cost of filing? I mean, the cost of filing, the, the, the fees are, are, especially if you're what's called a micro entity, you get a, you get a discount basically if you're, if you're just a solo or you're a really small company, you can get a basically 75% off the patent office fees. So it's a few hundred bucks. Um, if you hire an attorney to write a patent for you, patent application for you, costs to write it, um, typically run between $7,500 and $10,000-ish, uh, depending on what it is. Um, and then to prosecute it all the back and forth in the patent office is usually around another $10,000. So this is this is one of the downsides of the patent patent um, protection is it's probably the most expensive type of protection there is. Um, trademark, I think, tends to be 
uh, considerably cheaper, right, Lindsay? Yeah, she's like, yeah, that's what she's like. That's why I do that. <laughs> uh, and yes. how about from Danielle, Carol? Danielle, let's see. do you want to unmute? Yeah, go for it. No, Danielle, do you want to unmute and ask your question? I've got it if she doesn't want to, that's fine. Um, she <laughs> asked, how, how much protection does a provisional patent provide? Uh, provisional patent provides you uh, no protection. <laughs> if what it does is it holds your priority date. Uh, so, you know, when I said something has to be new, it's, uh, so they basically look at, you know, who came up with the idea first. And a, a provisional patent application will hold your priority date and you have in the US one year to file an actual, what's called a non-provisional application uh, you know, on, that, on that idea. Um, question, can you contact us? You can contact any of us and our contact information will be here at the end. So we love to hear from you. That would be great. Um, and then one more, Chris, one more, we could... Jonathan's had his hand up for a little while. Jonathan Burroughs, okay. you wanna jump in? Yes, I was wondering on the design patents, how unique is the design or what, what, how much aura I might, you might say is captured around the design because you see some, maybe some SUVs look almost identical between Ford and Chevy. So what is the, the requirement for differentiation? Well, it's, it's, it's actually fairly similar to the utility world as they look to see if there's, there are previous designs out there that look similar. Um, I mean, those legal standards are a little bit different, but what they will do is they'll, they'll literally pull up design patents for other SUVs and be like, I don't know. And you'll get these rejections. They'll say, look, this is, you know, this would not be new in the context. This would not be new in the context of the prior art that I've seen here. So it's, it's a very similar process from that. Mm -hmm. I will say that design patents are about 75% cheaper than utility patents. Mm -hmm. The average cost I was talking about before, that's, that's utility patents. Uh, design patents are considerably cheaper. Thank you. All awesome. Right. We'll move on to Lindsay's portion and then save some of these questions if we haven't been able to answer all of them. Keep them in the chat and or just wait uh, for a few more minutes and we'll open up a, a full-blown panel. Yeah, let's do that. All right, let me get the presentation back up here. All right, Lindsay, take it away. Thanks, Chris. Hi everyone, my name is Lindsay Sadler. I am a fifth year associate in the trademark copyright and we call it advertising group at Dorsey. So kind of what Chris mentioned, this um, trademarks, copyrights and trade secrets are all a form of intellectual property. Unlike Chris, we like to joke that patents are hard IP because you have to have a specialized education to practice it. Copyrights and trademarks are a little bit more of the softer IP. It deals a lot more with kind of branding. And I saw a lot of questions in the chat about, you know, some overlap with patents or what you can copyright. So we'll kind of touch on a little bit of the aspects that are different between this form of IP and patents. So trademarks include a variety of things. They're brand names, logos, slogans, even product shapes, colors, smells, and sounds. So they kind of run the gamut of different types of branding. But the main idea to take away from trademarks is they identify a source of goods and services, not necessarily a product themselves, but the source of those products. So for instance, the CU logo identifies the university. Um, Dorsey identifies our legal services. We're the source of legal services. Everyone knows the Just Do It Nike slogan, that's a registered trademark, but it can also move a little bit beyond just the words and the logos. Um, for instance, Tiffany, the blue box is a registered trademark. They are so well known for this little blue box that people see the color and associate it with Tiffany. Um, sounds as well, so the NBC chime is without even seeing it, you can just hear it and associate it with NBC. Another kind of convoluted thing that, um, that people don't necessarily assume are trademarks are the red soles to Christian Louboutin shoes are considered a trademark because it's so well known with Christian Louboutin that you see shoes like that, you think of the source, the company. Next slide, please. Um, 
some trademark tips, especially to think about as you are, you know, developing your business ideas, what you're going to call either your company or your product. All of these are trademark considerations. And my, one of my main practices is advising clients on the strength of a trademark, because there's a lot of different reasons why the stronger the mark, the better. And when I say strong mark, I mean that trademarks exist on a spectrum. The strongest marks you can do are called arbitrary or fanciful marks. And fanciful marks are essentially made up words. You think of Oreo or you think of Google. Those are not real words, especially when you think of Google for internet search services or Oreo for cookie. An arbitrary word is a real word that is applied to something completely arbitrary and irrelevant like Apple for computers. These are strong words and the easiest to protect against um, potential infringers. The weaker marks and actually marks that you can't even register are generic marks and those describe the goods that you're covering. So you would say Apple for a fruit stand is arguably generic and weak. Anyone can use Apple for a fruit stand. And then there's marks that are merely descriptive and suggestive that kind of fall within the middle of that spectrum. So trademark clearance is a lot of what we do as trademark attorneys is we help our clients make sure that the, the brand name that they want to pick for their business or their product isn't already taken. Because if you use a mark for similar goods to someone else who's already using it, you're gonna get a cease and desist letter. And then you open yourself up to trademark infringement and litigation liability. So what we do for trademark clearance is Apple, for instance, you know, when they first started the company, they said, you know what, Apple, we like this, we want to develop computers. So what we do is we take the word Apple and we do a whole clearance search because all trademark registrations are public record. So we sit down and we try to figure out what marks are similar to Apple for computers. And we'll tell you, oh, by the way, there's an orange, a company orange out there that's selling computers. That could be a problem. That's kind of confusingly similar. People might see Apple branded computers and orange branded computers and think those might emanate from the same source. And therefore, if you use Apple after orange has already been using it for years, you could get sued. So a lot of what we do in trademark clearance is making sure you have a strong brand name because you also don't want to invest thousands of dollars in marketing and branding only to get a cease and desist letter a year later saying you're violating my trademark rights, you have to rebrand. So it's good to pick a good strong name that's clear in the very beginning so you don't have to waste money with branding later on. Trademarks can be registered. There's a government agency, unlike patents that are in the constitution, trademark is statutory. So you can register it, it's called the United States Patent and Trademark Office. You register your trademarks, it gives you nationwide protection. So if you own a company in a coffee shop in Colorado called Sunburst and you sell coffee products and you register it, you can stop anyone around the entire country from using the name Sunburst for coffee. So you're in Colorado, Sunburst, you can send a cease and desist letter to someone in Maine who's using Sunburst for coffee. Common law rights mean you don't actually have to register a trademark to use it. You know, you start, you name your company something, you start using it, you have common law rights. But common law rights are substantially more narrow than registration, so you're limited in what you can do. And they're generally limited by geography. So if I'm operating a Sunburst coffee shop in Colorado and I've not registered that mark and someone opens a Sunburst coffee shop in Maine, there's nothing you can do about it because you've not registered your rights. So we always try to tell our clients, you know, it's, it's, it costs money and because you don't have to register it to use it, sometimes trademarks fall by the wayside, but a good strong strategy for your brand is to register it on the federal registry. Proper use as well is also to use your trademark as an adjective instead of a noun. So that means, you know, I own an Apple computer or I'm going to do a Google search. This keeps your name from becoming what's called generic. Um, a lot of very famous brands have become generic and are at risk of losing their trademark registration. Think of things like chapstick or Kleenex. People have used these as nouns, you know, hand me a Kleenex or I can't find my chapstick. 
These are actually brand names, same with Xerox, um, but they've become so commonplace in the marketplace for the products that they are instead of the brands and the source that they're gonna lose their, they've, they're at risk of losing their trademark protection. Um, oh, and do the circle R, I'm sure most of you have seen the circle R next to logos. That means that it's federally registered. The US Patent and Trademark Office has issued a registration. If you see the little superscript TM, that typically means that someone is claiming rights in that trademark, but it's not yet registered. So until you, if you filed a registration and you're seek, or you filed an application seeking registration, it's important to mark it with a TM to let people know this is a trademark. I am treating this as a trademark. Once it's registered, you can add the circle R. Next slide, please. Okay, copyrights. So I saw a couple, a lot of comments in the chat about, you know, can I, should I file for a copyright or should I file for a patent? Patents are inventions. Copyrights are more artistic expressions. Huh? So it's taking an idea and putting it down into a physical product, like a song or um, they can be literary, musical, dramatic, choreography, computer code. Copyrights kind of cover everything that's not a brand. It's an expression of artistic, you know, we like to call it creative spark, put down into something tangible. And you can cover that with a copyright. Similar to trademarks, you can, you, you can have a copyright. The second you create it, the second you write your book or you design your content on a website, you have copyrights. You can also register it with the Copyright Office. And this is valuable for enforcement and also for damages. You know, if someone, if you write a novel and someone plagiarizes that novel and you've registered it, you can sue them and get substantially more damages than you, than you would have been able to had you not registered it. Next slide, please. Copyright ownership. And this is a very important reminder, especially for early companies. Ownership is given to the person who creates the copyright. Unless, if you are a business, the person that creates it is a W-2 employee or there is a written agreement in place stating who owns the copyright. So if you're a business and you hire someone to draft all your, your computer code, but there's no W-2, they're technically an independent contractor and you have no agreement in place as to who owns that, the person who creates the computer code owns that copyright. You as the business might have paid them to do it and suddenly you don't own your own computer code. So it's really important to, when you're kind of drafting, you know, your business agreements and you're thinking about who's gonna create things to make sure you have clear, explicit statements over who owns what. And if an employee creates something for the company, who owns it? The business should probably own it. If you're paying them to do it, make sure the business owns it. Um, a real quick comment on copyrights and kind of the issues around ownership. I think a lot of people have heard about the Taylor Swift issue lately. Taylor Swift owns her music to the copyright, which is one variety of an artistic expression, but her label owned the actual recording of the copyright, which is a completely different artistic expression. Someone can own lyrics to a song, but how those lyrics are applied to music is a separate copyright because it's a separate artistic expression. Next slide, please. So copyright doesn't just cover artsy stuff. It covers content, as Mona asked. It covers content on a website. It covers computer software, annual reports, a monopoly board, the layout of a board. Um, it can also cover logo designs, which can be a trademark and a copyright. It covers photographs, lots of different things. It doesn't cover predominantly facts. So you can't copyright, you know, um, you can't copyright basic facts, history facts. You can copyright how those facts are displayed, how they're organized, how they're represented. So that's why textbooks can have a copyright, even though they're predominantly facts. It's the organization and the artistic expression that went into organizing those facts. Um, another important thing for businesses to keep in mind, I know I'm kind of pushing my time a little bit, but trade secrets are fast. If you have a limited IP budget, we generally advise our clients get your patent. If you have something that's patentable, get your patent first. It's expensive, but it also adds substantially more value to your company if you're acquired or late, you can license it later on. 
get your patent. Then later on, get your trademark. It's really important to get a trademark registration and to do the background work to get, make sure it's cleared so that you're not wasting money on marketing and branding for a mark that you suddenly cannot use. Copyrights are the lowest. Um, it's actually fairly easy to get your own copyright. I recommend looking at the Copyright Office. It's a great resource if you wanna do it yourself and very clear, very clear instructions. And if you make a mistake in your copyright application, it does not invalidate your copyright registration. If you make a mistake in your trademark application and someone finds it out later, it can invalidate your trademark. So that's why we do not advise clients to do trademark on their own, but copyrights are fairly easy and you can do it yourself. Next slide, please. The trademark, our trade secrets are pretty quick. Trade secrets are what they sound, it's a secret. Um, it has three criteria. And unlike trademarks and copyrights, you can't register a trade secret because registering a trade secret is making it no longer a secret. So trade secrets are, they have three criteria. It's, it has to have actual or potential economic value. It has to have values to others and you have to keep it a secret. Next slide, please. So there's a variety of different um, trade secrets. I saw Dave through a comment about the Coca-Cola recipe into the chat. Some people talked to, um, asked, he made a comment that Coca-Cola thought about patenting their formula. Patents are, can expire. So at some point the trade secret is no longer a secret because the patent expires. So instead they kept it a secret. They, no one knows what it is. They have super strict protocols to keep it hush hush because it has value to them. If everyone knew what the trade, uh, what the Coca-Cola recipe is, other people could then make it, which is detrimental to Coca-Cola. Think about recipes, ingredients, blueprints, computer code. If for some reason you, keep, you don't want to copyright it or it's not eligible for patent, but it's valuable to your company and could be valuable to others, keep it on the DL, keep it locked away because that's a trade secret and it adds value. A really interesting trade secret is um, the New York Times bestseller list. The list itself is not a trade secret because it's public, but how the New York Times determines whether a book is a bestseller, that system is hush hush because it adds value to New York Times that no one else can replicate it. Next slide, please. So the best way to protect a trade secret, confidentiality agreements, non-disclosure agreements, you have to make reasonable efforts to keep it safe. And that means confidential labels, internal policies on dissemination, usage, handling such secrets. You have to hold your employees accountable because your employees can be the ones to ruin a trade secret without even knowing it. Um, and so the very beginning of, you know, while you're operating a business, assume everything you produce is confidential until you know otherwise. So don't start sharing your computer code everywhere until you know you can't patent it and you can't copyright it because then you can protect it as a trade secret. I think, is that my last slide, Chris? Yes, sorry, I went over. No, that's awesome, Lindsay. I wanna add on to what you just said, which is uh, non-disclosure agreements. So those of you that know that next week is starting the mentor matching program. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you will learn about it soon and over the weekend. Uh, when you get paired with mentors and you're working with mentors, please, I beg you, do not ask them to sign non-disclosure agreements. Um, investors will never sign non-disclosure agreements except in very uh, unique cases and when you get to a very unique stage of their due diligence process. But when you're working with advisors and mentors and industry experts to help you, you'll, it, it'll be a little embarrassing to ask for uh, uh, them to sign uh, NDA. So just try to avoid that if you can. And Lindsay, we had uh, one of the first questions that came in from Alden. Uh, what about the strength of a company's name that has two words? For example, Patent Penguin, which I think is their company name, uh, which is a patent docking station, no, docking solution. Um, the length of a company name doesn't affect its, you know, registrability or whether or not it operates as a trademark. I mean, you can have one that's 15 words long and it doesn't change, but it might affect your registration. So a patent penguin for patent docketing solution, what that means is you can't necessarily claim rights in the word patent alone because it describes a function or a characteristic of your services. 
So we, we call it disclaiming, which means with the USPTO in your trademark registration, you have to disclaim any rights to the word patent alone, which means you can't enforce your rights against someone else who uses patent outside of the mark as a whole. So it doesn't remove the word patent from your trademark registration. It just means you can only enforce your rights for patent penguin or, you know, patent orca or something similar along those lines. You can enforce the mark as a whole against anyone who's using it for similar services. You couldn't say enforce, if you have a registration for patent penguin for a patent docketing solution, you couldn't then enforce it from someone who's using patent penguin for a restaurant because those services are not confusingly similar. People won't assume that one source is creating a patent docketing solution in a restaurant. But for you know, kind of the general bubble around your services, you can enforce the whole thing even though patent is relatively descriptive. Great, and Shane, I'm, I'm coming to you in just a second, but Kaushik, uh, do you wanna, I'm gonna put you on the spot, bud. Do you mind jumping in? Um, I know we had a good conversation going about uh, websites and buying them on domains and kind of altering them a little bit. Do you want, do you wanna jump in there with that or did you get your question kind of answered? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I did wanna ask one thing because um, in terms of like websites, the one that I put in the chat was like joinhandshake.com for Handshake, the career services tool that's used widely at schools. Um, you know, in terms of modifying a name slightly like that to get a .com as opposed to like a .io or some other extension, um, you know, what suggestions do you guys have around that? Um, when, you know, the domain that you're looking for, which is like company name.com might be more expensive to acquire due to like domain squatting or something like that. So I, I, I hope I understand your question correctly. Are you asking, you know, if, if .com is not available, do we recommend getting a .io or a .ai? Yeah, it's partially that. Um, and if not, like, would you also recommend considering like a slight modification of the name in the short run um, until you can acquire the name like company.com after you've raised money and whatever else? Yeah, I think so. Um, if you're using a trademark in a domain name, it, it still counts. So if you have a registered for Google and someone is using mygoogle.io or someone has just registered it and they're squatting on it, it's, it's important you know, it's important to protect the domain name because that's how people will find you. So, you know, we do recommend, especially IOs, .IOs are becoming incredibly popular. And a lot of our clients who, for some reason, the domain name that they want is taken or, you know, someone's using it and just for a completely different purpose, we'll recommend, you know, getting another popular domain name like .io and using that. And then we'll engage with in negotiations to either purchase the other domain name. Um, you should though make sure in the very early stages before you pick a name that the domain name that you want is available because that's a really important consideration. Like if you love this name, but you can't get a domain name for it, it's really confusing to tell people your company is one of some, is this thing, but, and most people just throw on a .com when they're trying to search for you. But if your domain name is vastly different than what your company name is, it's going to cause a lot of confusion and it's going to steer customers away from your, um, your, your website. So looking up domain names should be an initial consideration from the very beginning when you're picking a name. Because if, if there are no good domain names, you don't want to be, you know, get google.co slash us. Like you don't want to have this really convoluted domain name. It just means maybe that's not the name that you need because domain names are incredibly important. And Shane, do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, thank you, first of all, Lindsay. Um, I think it's a really interesting thing. I want to go back to the uh, Taylor Swift issue. I just want to ask, like, how do you differentiate between a creative expression and a creative reproduction? Because wouldn't the recording be a creative reproduction and she would still, I, I'm just trying to figure out how she doesn't have the rights to the recording of her expression but she has the rights to just her expression. It's a lot of contractual issues as well. Her label, you know, in, in their contract, her label owns quite a bit of the recording. So if you're a songwriter and you write down all the lyrics, you can own the, that's in a creative expression and you own the copyright in the lyrics. Say someone licenses the lyrics from you and creates an EDM version of the lyrics. They own that artistic expression with the EDM. Someone else can then take the, 
lyrics and make an acoustic version or a country version, and they would own that artistic expression. But if it incorporates the lyrics and you don't talk to the owner of the lyrics, they can sue for trademark infringement. That's why a lot of issues come up where you hear the same sound, might be two different songs. Um, I can't remember the name of the artist a few years ago. Marvin Gaye sued someone else. I can't remember who it was, but the sound was Marvin Alan Gaye. Thick's kid. Say that again. Robin Alan Thick's kid. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pharrell. Pharrell was the producer. Yes. So he owned, you know, our Marvin Gaye owned one version. He owned one sound. Pharrell, or I think that's what you said. He then took it and kind of remixed it, but there was enough of Marvin Gaye's version that he just cut and paste essentially. So he, so Marvin Gaye said he, you know, misappro or infringed his copyright. So he sued. So songs are very difficult. And that's why it's very, very clear to be, it's very important to be super clear in your contracts up front, who owns what. If you are a business or a music label and you hire a musician, make sure that you own everything because then you turn into the Taylor Swift issues where she might own the lyrics. And so she's re-recording everything because she doesn't own the sound recordings. She might own the lyrics, but she doesn't own the sound recordings. So she's going and creating everything over again because she can't do anything with the music she's already created. So copyrights are a very touchy subject. And I just, I can't stress this enough. Be clear in your contracts, who owns what. That is perfect to lead us into our next very, very quick chat uh, for just like a couple of minutes on team dynamics. Um, and then I know there's a lot more questions that came in for Lindsay. Hold those in about two or three, four minutes. We're gonna come back and open up the full panel for the rest of the time until 7 p.m. And all the questions that didn't get answered, um, let's, let's totally get those out. Uh, feel free when we go to the panel to just raise your hand and ask personal questions. Otherwise you can throw them in the chat. And definitely if you already put them in the chat, there's so many of them, go back and cut and paste them and um, put them and make them new questions for us. So it's easy for us to find them. But I, you know, we're, a lot of what we're talking about tonight um, has a lot to do with uh, team decisions. And a lot of you have co-founders. How many of you actually have team members that are joining you uh, on some of these ventures through NVC? Let me also ask, how many of you still need team members to fill some gaps in your companies? Okay, we will help you do that. And you will have probably over the next three or four weeks some time to get to know some people and add them to your teams. Also, when you're on Slack, go to the find a team channel and start soliciting their uh, handshake. Also, if you're looking for kind of more formal uh, people to join your team. But I, I think how many of you have worked in a team before building a company and it's not your first time? You probably know <laughs> that sometimes having a team can make things a lot easier and then sometimes it can make it a lot more difficult, right? Um, especially if you're friends with your teammates, sometimes that can cause a lot of uh, interesting dynamics. I'll say the first company I ever started, I made the wonderful decision to go into business with my very own sister, uh, my best friend and sister. And my second company that I went into business with was with my best friend. And you know, we think when we're best friends or we're siblings with people, there's not a lot we need to set up in advance, right? Because we all have each other's backs and we're all good friends. But a lot of what you're hearing tonight, you might not think these are conversations you wanna go into with your founders or your co-founders, but I will, I will be the first to tell you it's one of my biggest founder mistakes early in my entrepreneurial career was thinking it wasn't necessary that when, once we got made it big and started making money, we'd be best friends and out drinking cocktails and we would make all the decisions at that time. And I really wanna warn you against that. So some of these things start having the difficult conversations. That's what we're here talking about tonight. And you saw earlier uh, in Dave and Mike's presentation that you have a founder agreement that you need to produce for NVC. So the different, we'll send this out via Slack or you can take a picture of it tonight. We'll also send out uh, a copy of the deck so you can have it. 
couple of key things. We just need to see it not written up in any formal documentation, be as formal or informal. If you want to write it on a napkin and take a photo of it and submit it to NBC, I wholeheartedly condone that. Due on February 24th. So that will give you time to sit down and have some of these good conversations with your team. But one thing that I really want to point out that I'm a huge believer in, in all the coaching I do with teams that are trying to grow and become superpower teams. It's something called a team charter. It's better to start this early. If you start it late, it can cause culture issues and a lot of arguments. Um, if, you, if we have MBA students in the room or any of the students here tonight that have worked in cohort style groups, you probably know what a team charter is. And there are many different, you can Google it and download a document. I really like the way Mural has it set up because it's great for virtual. This is a Mural. <laughs> It'll let you sit as a group. You take an hour and a half, come up with the things that you see on the right side, your core values, your norms. How are you going to handle conflict when it arises? This will save you and help your productivity so drastically if you're all aligned here. Because the thing is, we're all unique. And we all work in very different ways. And this document helps you all work a little bit better. So it's not required. It's just a recommendation. Um, I'd, I'd love for everybody to unmute themselves just for a quick second. And I don't, if you talk over each other, that's great. But just tell me, what do you think creates team success to you personally? Just yell it out. I mean, communication. Communication. communication and empathy. Gosh, I heard a lot of the same words. That's amazing. A lot of communication and a lot of empathy, right? These are just a couple of great things that make teams a success. And I just wanted to throw this up there because a lot of what we're hearing tonight will determine your team's success. And that's why I want you to, um, we'll, we'll have a slide here at the in a few minutes with how to get in touch with uh, the folks you met tonight at Dorsey if you have extra questions that or help that you wanna go to them over. So for now, I wanna cut and uh, let's go ahead and open up a discussion. Um, let me just, if I can actually unshare my screen here. And let's go ahead and throw some stuff in the chat or raise your hand and we will start getting some Q&A going for the rest of the 16 minutes that we have here. And maybe just uh, direct your question either to Chris, Dave, Mike, or Lindsay, or just direct your question by topic so, so they know how to answer. Um, start out with Luke, you wanna ask your question? Yeah, for um, patents, um, what if your product um, hooks up to another product that is patented? Uh, does your, would, would the product require the other product to work? Um, yes, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, so you, that's, that doesn't necessarily mean your idea is not patentable. I could use a double negative. Um, you can, and if their patent is out in the public domain, right, you could, um, you could you could potentially uh, get a patent on you know, basically the thing they're doing plus the thing that you're doing as well. The problem could be you might be infringing their patent, right? If you're if the thing you're doing requires their stuff, you might be infringing their patent. So that's another. We didn't even talk about infringement, so that's a, but that's another consideration. You might actually be stepping on their patent. You might be on their lawn, and you might get a the the uh, cease and desist letter, which is the lawyer's version of get off my lawn, right? So. <laughs> So that's another okay. consideration is whether you're infringing their um, their patent. Um, it will, will say if I'm not creating a patent, um, would I get any in any trouble just? Uh, so yeah, you could still be even without you know, whether you have a patent or not. Like I said, a patent doesn't give you the right to do anything. So the fact that you're you if you're infringing somebody's stuff, you could be infringing it whether you have a patent or not. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And going back, Lindsay, we had a question for you. Um, can you talk about the differences between a confidentiality agreement and an NDA? Are they the same, different, uh, and uh, what are the distinctions? 
I think, um, you know, Mike and Dave can jump in a little bit too. They add these to the contracts they work with, but generally a confidentiality agreement holds someone to, you know, confidentiality, confidentiality standard. It defines what is confidential to the company, what the company like is treating as confidential while a non-disclosure agreement can prevent future dissemination from, you know, future, if, if an employee leaves your company, they can't then disclose that information, you know, in perpetuity, or they can't go to a competitor and use that information. So they're generally the same thing. And they're in some regards, and they have a lot of overlap, but NDAs typically, you know, prevent future dissemination while conf confidentiality typically defines what is confidential. From the purely contractual perspective, they're actually the same thing. So there, you might ask 10 lawyers who would say, well, I think of it this way or that way, but fundamentally and for business practical purposes, they're the same thing. Yeah, don't, don't let the title of an agreement fool you. Um, you can call an agreement whatever you want, and then the body actually sets out what it is. In fact, I'm today, uh, as Dave knows, I've, I've been um, um, dealing with a problem because um, Y Combinator has a um, financial instrument called a post money safe. And it is a weird agreement because the safe actually converts pre-money. So it says in the title, post-money. I have founders asking me, it's clearly post-money. And yet, when you read the words, it converts pre-money. I know that sounds like a very um, mundane problem, but it's the exact opposite of the title. So I can have an agreement that says, a this is the easy agreement and it's 75 pages eight point type single spaced and it's anything but easy so don't let the title fool you it's what's in the agreement that counts awesome and then jonathan um i think you may have put it in slack to or in the chat do you just want to jump in and ask your question for rose Right. So I was asking um, it, when when forming a collaboration of team members, and maybe maybe there's a mix where we have some founders, or we or we just have um, one founder, for example, and and it hasn't been figured out yet, but we want to <laughs> we want to put the IP into the company before we know what people are going to contribute. We don't really know how to set up the equity. So how, how, how do we sort through that? And do we have to have that sorted out for the assignment of the IP to be valid? Well, yeah, so, so typically what you do, um, and sorry, I'm talking to the corporate attorneys, but uh, well, you'll, you'll and jump in guys, but typically you'll have an obligation to assign an invention. You don't know what the invention is. Yet. You'll have an obligation to assign and you could put that in the, in the founder's agreement. Like you uh, agree mutually that everybody's there to, or any employees to, um, assigning the inventions to the company. When you actually do the assignment of the invention, you've invented the widget, you'll do a separate agreement, which is called an assignment. And your earlier question is, does that need um, consideration? Yeah, you'd have to have, you have to exchange something of value because an assignment is a contract like any other contract. So you have to exchange something of value. And I've seen, I've seen assignments um, for a dollar. Um, I myself you know, was an inventor on something and they paid me a thousand dollars. So it's all over the place. Um, but Mike and Dave, you wanna jump in at all? Yeah, so uh, Jonathan, generally speaking, when founders start a company, they sign what are called PIIAs. And again, as Mike said, it doesn't really matter what the document's called. Founders sign documents that assign their intellectual property rights to the company. You don't have to get cash for it. Frequently with founders, they're just saying, I'm getting stock in the business. I'm becoming an owner. In exchange for becoming an owner, I'm assigning all my IP rights to the company. So, you know, technically speaking, particularly among founders, you don't get tripped up as much on getting cash for what you're doing. You're just contributing your IP and you're a shareholder and you're getting shares for your assignment. Um, you don't have to be really specific about it necessarily. A really well-drafted IP assignment, it may refer to the very specific thing you care about, but with founders generally, it's actually just saying, if I create anything patentable or copyrightable or protected by trade secret, whatever it may be, you're essentially saying anything and everything I create is being assigned to the company, um, at least if it relates to the business of the company. Yeah, so we have a pretty big team. So 
I don't want to, it's like, I don't want to say, okay, here's three founders, but we have like 10 people. And I don't want to say, or everybody's 10% owner either yet. So I don't really know how to do it. Um, I could say like, uh, everybody for collaborating on this project, are what we generate is going into the company and how we, how we exactly, I want to, I want to give everybody a fair, uh, um, you know, a fair share, but I, I don't know exactly. I don't really have any idea how to go about figuring out, figuring that out. Yeah. So, so we're, yeah, go, go ahead, I, go. I was going to say, keep in mind that when you grant stock and you have essentially points, um, that's not forever. Um, a successful company will often see uh, the founder's ownership percentage diluted over time as investment and other people join the company. If it turns out that you know of the uh, you've allocated to four people and one person's not holding their own, that's where vesting comes in. That person might get fired, and those shares will come back to the company. So don't get too hung up on um, this is my twenty five percent stake. And it will never change ever. Um, it it will. Um, a second thing is, although uh, we use the word founder a lot, there's no formal um, relationship uh, or the formal title in in the U.S. of what it means to be a founder. So people get very hung up on it. Whether you're a founder of a company will often be seen um, looking backwards rather than today. I can, Dave and I might found a company today, but if I leave tomorrow and he goes on to great success, he and whoever he partners up with, they're going to be the founders. Nobody will remember me. Uh, you know, as you know, as you may be aware, there was a third founder at Apple and he didn't, he was a lawyer who didn't last very long. Nobody talks about him. He's not really a founder. Who cares? Um, and the last thing I'll say is, one word of caution is try not to divide the pie up too much. I recognize this is a student competition and that may be how it's done, but eventually the people who are driving the company who are in, in, in any group, there'll be a group that is putting their all into it and there'll be a group who sort of drives by. Um, if if you divvy up the pie too much, nobody will care anymore. So if you have 10 people at each 10%, you're gonna have a hard time succeeding because nobody's gonna really care. Uh, I, I know this may not be popular, but, um, but if you have three people at, um, I'm gonna make it up 25% each, and then the other people who are gonna put in a little bit they're at 5% each, they're actually more likely to succeed. Um, uh, it's something we caution founders because um, you're not making any money. And uh, so if you don't have an equity stake that motivates you, you will lose interest uh, quickly. Um, it, uh, I'm not sure what the right philosophy, moral problem is, uh, that's identified, but essentially, if you don't have a stake, you won't care. Uh, Chris, can I ask you, as we're kind of uh, coming up to the end here, do you mind sharing if you have a slide with your contact information? Uh, I know there's a couple of people that are uh, wanting to see that. So just leave it up for a minute or two so that everybody can take a quick snapshot of it. Definitely reach out to these folks as a resource and also link with them on LinkedIn. Um, that's going to be uh, uh, something you definitely want to do. So I, a couple more questions. And again, I will stay around from 7 to 7.30, just myself, for anyone that wants to uh, ask questions about NVC in particular. So save those till 7 o'clock. But uh, let's see, Shane, you've had your hand up for a while. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, so I'm just curious if our idea itself is not technically patentable is the methodology behind building our idea or how our idea works in terms of like a pipeline or functionality standpoint is that patentable or is are we kind of just left in the in the water with 
where anybody can kind of take our idea? Um, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. So the there, there's a there's a thing in patent law called um, product by process, and basically if the you know, if the if the product at the end of the day is the same from process A versus process B, um, they, the patent office doesn't really distinguish between those. Um, that said, I mean it's it's hard to say. Um, depending on I mean the it would depend on the details of, of what you're exactly doing. I mean if it's your if you're making a, an actual like physical object, um, the method of making that it the method might be patentable. It's possible. So. It's hard to say without looking at the details. I can jump in a little bit there. If you put it down in a blueprint or a manual or something that's copyrightable. And so you can right. protect, you know, the un like blueprints, for instance, to build a house, even though, you know, you, you probably couldn't copyright the house, you can copyright the blueprints, which are the method for building the house. You just have to, you can't just leave it in your head. You have to put it down pen to paper and create something with those ideas in terms of if you write a manual or literally draw them up in a blueprint or something, those that's subject to copyright. So you're not left in a lurch um, just because the end product might not be protectable, but the, the method could be. Excellent. Any last words from our four guests before I kind of wrap things up? I did want to I jump in. I saw a couple of comments real fast um, in, in the chat about you know, jurisdictions, trademarks are US based. If you file with the US Patent and Trademark Office, if you foresee, you know, moving to Canada or Mexico or the EU or something, you're going to need protection in, you know, those jurisdictions. And a big one we get a lot of clients talking about is China. Even if you're not selling your product in China or doing business in China, if you're manufacturing there, if you're sourcing goods there, if your distributor is there, because there is a big infringement issue um, with squatters and you know people making counterfeits in China. It's a really good enforcement strategy to get protection in China. It's a first to file jurisdiction while um, trademarks in the US are based off of use. In China, you know, you're first to file, first to get it on in the registry there. You can protect, you know, from counterfeits and people who are trying to knock off your product. So there's a lot of international enforcement and international jurisdictions filing for trademarks that are very important. Just wanted to make and that. I, yeah, and the same thing for patents too. It's you need one in every jurisdiction you want to be protected in. And, David, and there are ways to do an international sort of an application that then you can help you know, preserve your place in line in a lot of different countries and then pursue them in those countries later. And David, Mike, did you have any last uh, last things you wanted to throw out there? Or? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, um, thank you all for participating for one thing. And um, this stuff can get really complicated really quickly, but your goal is to build a business and a company that is successful. You want to be working with lawyers and accountants that can help you solve some of these problems. So although, as you can appreciate, there's lots of conversations and lots of topics to cover legally when you're actually going to start a company. Uh, if you're working with the right legal team and the right set of advisors, this isn't months and months of heavy negotiation. You really want to keep it pretty simple to start. So lots of good questions. And uh, just thank you all for asking them. Absolutely. Uh, thank you as well. And, uh, you know, most of these problems uh, outside of the patent and trademark, you know, for Dave and I, most of these problems can be solved later um, as well. So just get started and we'll fix it uh, when we get a chance. Uh, just don't let it go too long. That's awesome. We're at time. And I just, uh, everybody on the call, thank you for putting all the thank yous in the chat box. Uh, Dorsey does this in their spare time and at night, even away from their families. So thank you for saying thank you to them. Uh, I want to say thank you to the four of you. Super appreciate everything that you brought to this conversation. Really necessary at this stage. So reach out to them, link with them on LinkedIn. Thank you for joining tonight. And it's gonna be a really fun couple of months, a really hardcore fast paced, but very fun. We have over $150,000 to award to dozens of teams at all stages. And that money is yours to keep no matter what you do with your companies. So use this information. We'll post it on the NVC website and stick around for the next half an hour if you just wanna hit me up for some NVC questions. Thanks Good to luck, Dorsey. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. I'm gonna hang, I'll hang around for a little bit too. So. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to hang out.
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, gang. Those of you hanging out, um, it's not going to be too many of us. So uh, let just unmute yourselves and whatever questions you have. Let me see what I can answer in 30 minutes or less. I have a really quick question. I'm yeah. not sure if my mic is working now. It is. Oh, oh perfect. Okay. Um, awesome. So just out of curiosity, I'm still trying to find, as I think we had spoken about a while ago, um, find like a business partner or potentially two. And I'm wondering for NVC purposes, is it acceptable to find someone who is outside of CU or is that? Yes, thanks. I saw that in the chat and I, I was hoping you'd stick around, Danielle. So absolutely. Uh, only one member of the team needs to have a CU buff card. That can be a staff member, faculty or student. And then if you want to hire a whole or bring on a founder that lives in Slovenia, that that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And Danielle, definitely uh, on Slack, hit the, hit up the find a, a team channel and or hit up your cohort leads to help you get team members if you're looking within the university. Will do. Okay. Thanks. You bet. I've got a, I've got a question more for, uh, I guess, Chris specifically because it has to do with IP. Um, so if you uh, start looking at, you know, maybe starting to reach out to like for like a seed round through uh, venture capital, like how much more likely are they to sit down with you with versus without um, either a full patent and then even like a provisional patent? Um, and does it sort of change the relationship that you might have with them? Or will they just not even talk to you and say, come back when you have a patent? So, and there, there are a couple of considerations. Um, and I don't think, yeah, I think Dave and Mike hopped off, but um, one thing, so VCs will never, and somebody I think mentioned this, VCs will never, almost never sign an NDA. So um, one of the nice things about sitting down with VC where you've got, already got your application filed, and it can even be a provisional application, um, is that you can talk to them about it because now it's, you know, it's already been filed with the patent office and they don't get, provisionals don't get published, but at least it's protected, right? It's, uh, you know, provided you can come within a year and convert it into a non-provisional. Um, the other thing is it it absolutely changes the dynamic of the um you know because if you you know if you don't i mean think about the things so like like dave and, and mike said like you're building a company you have a box you're putting assets into so you think about what those assets are well it's the know-how of how you do build your widget you know how you your source code your your trade secrets your things like that like your customer if you have like a big customer base like all that contact information customer lists those are assets. The big one is the IP, but or the the patents. And if you don't haven't actually filed any patents, don't have any, um, then you, you, that asset isn't in there, and, and it's not. It's not um, so it will it will absolutely change the game. So. That's great. Thanks, Chris. Jump in there. What other questions do y'all have for me or for Chris? Chris, I've got a question for you. So uh, let's say, for example, I've got a patent on a sailboat and I okay. want to sell plans of that. So it's technically a blueprint, I guess. What kind of protection would I have? Uh, so, so here's the thing. When you, when you file a, a patent um, application, it, it, there's this quid pro quo. It, basically, the, the requirement is you tell everybody in the world how to do it, how to make the, the sailboat. And it's it's public. Like literally anybody with an internet connection or who walks into the patent office can get a copy of it, right? Um, so uh, they will have, depending on what you put in the disclosure, they'll have the plans, right? But um, if somebody wants to, you can then sell the plans. Basically, you, you could sell the plans for the license, right, to use the patent. Because if somebody goes and takes your plans and builds your sailboat, they're infringing your patent. So if you want to sell the you know, sell the, the, the blueprints to go sell, sell the sailboat, you could do that and say like, here, I give you the license to build one sailboat, right? And and I won't sue you for infringement. So thank you. Yeah, that would work. Yeah. Sure. Uh, let me throw out there too, Chris, because I don't know the answer to this, and I don't know if this is your realm or not. But um, when you're having a web developer that's not really part of your team, you're just kind of outsourcing uh, develop uh, your tech. Should you have them sign any kind of agreement or NDA? Um, so again, this is just what Lindsay talked about with yeah. uh, copyright. It's really, really important that if you have developers who are working for you, 
uh, to make it clear that you, you the company, you know, own the rights to whatever they produce. It's really important to make that make that clear up front and make make sure that they agree to it. And that way, that I mean, when uh, when Daryl was talking about team dynamics, one of the things that came up again is communication, right? Clear expectations, communication. It's no different in the law, right? It's really important to to the extent you can make it up front, clear with everybody what it is that you're doing. I'm going to I'm going to give you money. You're going to give me source code, and you're going to give me the rights to the copyright for the source code, right? Excellent. Um, and I see, uh, oh, Max, the answer to your question is right now we have about 115 teams signed up, but I expect over the next day that to grow. Any other questions, NVC or for Chris at Dorsey? Chris, I had a question for you. Um, just mm -hmm. something out of general curiosity. Um, so let's say you have a venture and like you've already made a founder's agreement and everything and you've like divvied up equity, right? Um, and mm -hmm. All of the equity is divvied up among, let's say, three people, four people, whatever. If you bring on like a VC or an investor or something like that, like on Shark Tank, for example, they're like, I'll, you know, I want $500,000 for 10% or whatever. How does that work? Do you have to like remake your founder's agreement and redistribute equity or what is the whole, you know, process procedure around that. I was just curious. So, so this, is, this is a little bit out of my ballpark, but um, I, uh, I, I, and so Dave touched on this though. It's, it's basically, as he said, you know, when you issue shares or maybe it was Mike, when you issue shares as, as founders, you know, over time, as you get more investors come in, the, the founders can get diluted, right? You, you've all seen the social network, right? About the founding of Facebook, the movie, right? When, uh, was the other Facebook guy, not Mark Zuckerberg, right? Basically got diluted out of existence. Um, so, uh, you know, typically with the, the, um, the company will issue more shares and those will go to the VC and they, they may become, you know, you know, if you, if you, between your, your five founders issued, you know, a thousand shares each, but the VC wants, you know, control the company, then they'll, they'll get enough shares that they have controlling shares. Right. Okay. So it's just a redistribution of shares where now you're a corporation, you've got a certain amount of shares and you need to grow that. So then you can distribute it to. Um, yes, I don't think it's, it's as much of a redistribution as it is a an issuing of more shares. The okay. pie gets bigger, right? Yeah, right. So I, I believe that's typically how it works. But you know, right. don't quote me. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Thank you. Yeah. What other questions do y'all have? Is there an uh, in despair a template that could that could help us kind of see or figure out how to have this? How this, uh, how, how all that works, like how to set up, like, uh, you know, what percentage, which, what percentage I should, I should give to different people or, you know, or model it somehow. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a great question, Jonathan, because it comes up all the time, even with um, when, when I was working at the accelerator in Boulder, um, companies that, uh, that are even starting to make revenue. You know, that this is the age old question and Chris, maybe you have a better answer. Um, this is something, there is no cookie cutter form. It's something that you go out and you ask a lot of different people that have already done this, what their recommendations are. Uh, it's the same thing when you're, you're building out founders agreements and how that's gonna be distributed. You wanna just get opinions and everyone will have a little bit of a, a different opinion. Um, same when you are offering equity to advisors, uh, you'll have some advisors that think they deserve 7% equity, which is insanity. And you, you have the, the standard, which is like, you know, 0.75% when you're talking about equity. So it's about just asking around, uh, to different people that you trust as mentors and, and then you're making that decision on your own. But Chris, uh, I, I think that's right. It's, it. It is going to depend on, on your specific situation. Um, and it's like, like there's, there's no, there's no cookie cutter. Um, it's, yeah, I guess that's, that's the best way to put it. And it, it, at the end of the day, it depends on what you want, right? What you, what you and your founders want. Right. I, what, I, what I'm thinking is, so we, we're, we're totally unfunded right now, but I want my team to be motivated and I, and I realized that we're not going to get anything done without 
with that teamwork. Um, at the same time, I don't know what, you know, I don't really know, you know, who's going to really, who, who's going to contribute a huge amount or, or who's, who's, who's not going to contribute a huge amount. It seems like I could, I could structure some kind of an agreement with my team that says, this is a pool of equity and, and, and everybody, everybody that's contributing and earning towards can, can earn towards getting more, more of this pool. And, um, and, and if we all make it to the end, we'll be, we'll be all rich. But if, if we don't, if we don't succeed, then at least we tried, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Lee in the, um, in the chat, I think just hit it on the, on the head, right? She, she uh, says, I, I recommend a vesting structure based on the number of hours they put into a month. And this is, this is something that uh, Mike touched on is vesting, right? Is, you know, if you've got the, um, you know, if you've got three three founders and you know they're all split a third each and then somebody leaves next week they still get a third each right so uh having some sort of investing schedule in there um and if you ever worked at a company where you're getting your know, stock options or, or shares as part of your your comp um there'll be a vesting schedule right and you know you vest after like you know so much per year until you're five really fully vested at five years something like that so that's, that's pretty typical you know chris you mentioned um vesting over time contribution of hours but it, i guess it could just as well be vested for accomplishment so working software is worth this working sure. hardware is worth this absolutely because honestly it's hard to monitor time when we're virtual working over zoom yeah that's true right and, and really we should tie to accomplishment not just Right. Dave, Dave right. is on my team. We're, we were talking about maybe we could do like uh, objective key results and see, like somehow measure contribution towards achieving these objective key results. And and and, and, and the more that you do, the the more you're getting you're gonna you're gonna get. Um, well, I think I think you're right. Having an objective measure is also really important, so it doesn't turn into survivor where you're trying to vote somebody off the island, right? Right. <laughs> Right, and an objective measure, so hours or deliverables, right? Deliverables, yeah. Jonathan, at Liji, thanks for putting that in there. Again, um, put a cliff on that, and it's pretty standard to do a one-year cliff, which basically says you will get these shares, but you have to remain with the company for at least one year because it's very normal in these early stages that founders will bail within the first year, and you don't want them walking away with uh, pieces of your company. Right, yeah. Um, Max, solo foundership, right? Not, not, to, not a worry at all. You may, between the deadline, which is February 24th, you may find, who knows, you might find another founder or some team members. So hang tight with um, uh, probably till the last minute and turning in your um, founder's agreement. And if you are solo, just write that out. Just say founder's agreement. Here's the name of my company. It's just me. Founders agreement is I get everything. <laughs> so fill out those just so we know and we don't hit you up for it later. Uh, Tara. Oh, sorry. Did something... Okay, sorry. Uh, Tara, I did have a question on that. Um, so if we are registered as like a sole proprietorship in terms of like um, a legal entity, mm -hmm. do we need to do anything formal then in terms of like a founder's agreement? Necessarily? Well, so the founder's agreement, just imagine it is something you sign with your, your teammates on the back of a bar napkin. All right. This is not a real, true, genuine founder's agreement, right? That okay. is many, many pages long in a document that you're going to pay to have, um, written up for you. This is just something that says we actually sat down for at least 10 minutes and we all put our names and pen to paper and said, we agree that we are gonna split money like this. Here's the name of our company. Here's the name of the team members. Here's what we've decided to do. It's not a legal document for not NBC. Binding. It's binding between you guys as much as, and Chris, you can talk to how binding that is or not. Okay. So I'll, I'll tell you, um, um, it could very it could very well be binding, right? So okay, even, right. so there 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 is a famous case where somebody uh, sold his house um, by writing up a deed on the back of a napkin at a bar, and it went all the way to the not not the U.S. Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court of the state that it was in, and yeah, he uh, he ended up selling his house uh, on a bar napkin. 
So it's, uh, um, these could very well be binding between between you. I mean, is there anything that classifies something as like binding? Like, do you have to say in writing this is binding, or if if it's not uh, specified, then is it assumed as binding? What it comes, what it usually comes down to, is whether there's consideration. Um, there's there are other things as well, but okay. consideration is so it's mutually um, mutually exchanged um, obligations. Like, you know, I will give you, I, you know, I will give you X hours out of my life, which I'm counting on my my life expectancy wristwatch, um, in exchange for shares of the company. So there's got to be some sort of exchange uh, for it to be binding usually. And Clifford, did you have a question earlier that we didn't get to? Yeah, I was going to ask about the more, more NBC specific questions. So yep. I see that there is an events schedule online. Is that the totality of events of mandatory events or are there other events? Yes, and, the, and what will dictate mandatory, uh, your cohort leads will put a message out to you. There's really only this one and um, uh, there's two in the month of February on how to pitch and all of the pitch regulations, right? So if you can't be there because you have class, you just let your cohort leads know so that you can watch the video. But the mandatory ones are, if you don't go, you're gonna miss information that could get you disqualified, unfortunately, like it's pertinent info. Um, if one of your team members can attend, that's good enough. And then we just hold them to passing it on to you. So it's just this one and two on pitch in February and the rest of NVC is not mandatory. There are a bunch of pitch competitions, little ones um, coming up in March that uh, basically give a lot of people a different, a couple of different uh, abilities to go out and pitch. And then the big competition, uh, we start round one uh, the last day of March and then the final championship round with the finalist eight teams will be April 13th. Those are the only real mandatory things are the round one and the April 13th. All the other pitch competitions are if you, only if you want to, and most of the workshops are if you want to. Any other questions for, let's see. Oh, uh, Annie, if, uh, if we have not registered our company yet, what is the risk of participating in NBC? Um, I don't know if you wanna throw your mic on, Annie, just so I can clarify. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by risk in participating? Yeah, uh, I mean, not really um, risk, but it kind of, it, you know, we're looking for continuing to develop our idea and, you know, continuing to work on our company in general, but haven't really fleshed out a full, I mean, companies are at all various stages in yeah. this program, right? So if we're very, very early on, um, you're in the right place. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah register it right right this is this is real life entrepreneurship uh register your company with whatever info you've got if you don't have a name for the company yet pick one you can always change it later if you pivot and you change product design if you pivot and change your go-to-market strategy or who your customer is all that's fine if you pitch and after the pitch you change everything, that's fine too. It's an ever-changing, just like normal entrepreneurship. So I say register and give it your best. Okay, great. And, but we, I mean, I know we're talking about like trademarks and patents and all that right now, but that's, I mean, we're not nearly there yet for- no. <laughs> And doing. you know, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of, if not the majority of these teams won't deal with any patents or uh, trademarks or anything until after NVC is over. Okay, great, thanks. You bet, you bet. Are we doing in pitch person or in person pitches like last year's? No, unfortunately not. Um, going to be a unique. Uh, you're going to get live feedback, of course, uh, from judges. So you, it will be live on Zoom, but it will not be live in person, unfortunately. Yeah, but which is actually good because I think this year is the year that everybody becomes freaking pros at how to deliver a pitch online because even when COVID's finished and over, if we don't go into it once again, later down the road, even if we never deal with it again, our life of pitching on camera on a Zoom is our reality. So I'm gonna help you become pros at pitching 
into a camera and then come back to NBC next year and we'll teach you how to do it on stage in front of a thousand people. I have a question about teams. Yeah. Um, if let's say like a quarter of your team's like not as engaged as the other three quarters, how do you bring up that conversation? And then knowing that they're not willing to put in that commitment and without having to like, I guess the, I guess it's like, ideal scenario would be like to kick them out but how do you have that conversation um just for context um we have a team of five half our team dropped out of university to pursue it full-time and then other the other half is kind of like doing it part-time um so it's kind of like are you in it or are you not because like we're getting to the stage where we're starting to ramp up our beta is coming to a close and soon we'll need to scale yeah, you're, you're a little bit further ahead. So I would say two things. One, you got to do what's best for the company, but you're also, are you the CEO? Uh, I'm one of the main stakeholders. Okay. You're also a leader. And so the best recommendation I would say is these difficult conversations will happen all throughout your career of being an entrepreneur. So use this one as a practice and if you can stay non-defensive and you say, this is a practice, I'll have to do this a hundred more times in my life and go in with curiosity rather than anger and frustration and just say, hey, I'm just here. Maybe even bring the team charter into it and say, we're setting norms and the norms are everybody's gonna work 25 hours a week. Can you guys handle that? Oh, you can't? I'm curious why? Because let me also share my story, which is we are starting to scale and we need full time. So you basically just come at them with care, but with the strength behind, we need to get serious now. Um, if you guys aren't, it doesn't sound like you're able to put in the time, I think we might have to start looking for other people and see how that conversation plays out, but stay curious the whole time because then you'll feel good about it, how it goes, they'll feel good, and then you can make some unemotional decisions. Yeah, it's a it's a nerve wracking conversation. It's hard. I think people have in the back of their mind, but it's hard to bring it up. So. Yeah. But it's it's right. so important, it's so important because if you let it fester and you try and scale and you've got these laggards who are doing nothing, it's gonna be way worse later. Pull the be way worse later. So do it now. Great question, though. Oh yeah, it's it's a good. Good uh, thing there, Clifford. Taper the relationship kindly because they might come back to join you later. Plus they're gonna be your brand ambassadors. You don't want them going out into the world being like, oh my God, these guys are such jerks. You want them praising you. So in, flip, the, flip the script in your brain and say, I'm not gonna go in super apprehensive to this conversation. I'm gonna go in trying to win these guys over while tapering off the relationship. <laughs> It'll be a good challenge. Any last couple of quick questions? Oh yeah, Max had to do it too. Yeah, it's a hard one. Um, will, will they give us criteria, kind of like a judging criteria for the NVC and yeah, so we can. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they totally will. You you all haven't gotten too much information yet because we've just been onboarding teams. Registration ends tomorrow night. So next week, you're going to start getting everything like mentor matching is happening. Take that very seriously. Um, after that, we're going to start telling you about all the criteria for the pitch competitions and what the rubrics are and what you're being judged on. Uh, I'm going to go through two full pitch workshops with you in February to tell you what needs to go into the pitch, how to story tell your pitch, how to public speak. Um, it's all going to start un un unraveling uh, um, in the next week just know it's what you want to make out of it. You don't have to go to any of this stuff except the mandatory stuff and you can still pitch and try to win some money. And if you want to do everything, you can do that too. So it's what you make out of it. Any, did I miss anybody's? Jump in here if I missed you, sorry. It's a lot in the chat box. Tara, um, I, I did have one question for you. Yeah. Um, as in a, in unrelated to what I asked before. Um, I'm curious, I know you touched on this before. Um, what is generally the stage of these companies when they come to like pitch at NBC? Like, are they pretty far? I, I know there's a range, right? There's a wide gamut of different people, obviously, but 
you know, are these people who have like tested and validated, um, you know, prototype? Cause I'm just trying to budget, you know, how do we optimize these next couple months? Yeah. Um, cause I'm doing not just one, but two different things. Uh, one through senior capstone and the other through a uh, new venture launch with Jeff York. So just trying right. to, budget, how do we optimize time? Um, because right now it's like, okay, we have two months, but that's going to come by fast, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And the bummer is the way the semesters work. Like you're working with Jeff. Uh, if you're in a, uh, like I'm teaching a business uh, plan writing class right now, if you're in yeah. any of yeah. these classes or courses, yeah. the courses are going to go much slower than NVC. So you are going to have to like hyperdrive to right, get right, right. some semblance of a pitch right. and pitch it at NVC when you're going to be like, I haven't even finished my customer discovery in Jeff York's right. class, right? Right, right? It's just kind of part of the process. Most of NVC is supposed to be fun. And I will tell you to answer your question because it's a real good one. 85% of the teams are undergrad and have never built a company before. And this is a, at the, they're at the beginning idea stage. The yeah. other 15%, have been working on it for a year or more. They yeah. maybe even have gotten a little bit of grant money. They participated in NVC last year. They'll be doing right. it again this year. And the companies that typically go to the championship round, the final eight and whoever wins. I mean, the last couple of winners have all gone on to raise money. They're all functioning, revenue generating. So the final eight are pretty serious. Doesn't mean that a newcomer can't make it there. It, that does happen every year, right? but the majority of everyone competing are newcomers. And that's why we have all the other little mini pitch competitions, because then you're not like, but I can't make it to the final round, but right. you have all these other that you can win 5k, 7k, you know? Right. And is there funding given if you like advance, let's say from like round one to round two and round two to the finals, or is it just yeah. the finals? Nope. Yep. There's money given at all the four prize nights in March. Right. Okay. Uh, which you'll get all the information for next week. Okay. There's money given at round one. There's money given at round two and there's money given at round three. Oh, great. Awesome. Yeah. Lots awesome. of money, my friend. <laughs> Not a bad thing. Awesome. Thank you all for hanging out. Um, especially those of you that I see your faces every single time we get together, like that's dedication. And I'm, I'm really, really stoked to see where you guys are going to go. Like dedication is everything. So thanks for hanging out and being uh, super awesome to all the guest speakers and reach out if you need anything and get on Slack. Slack's going to be where it's at this year. Um, and nice to see you all. And Chris, thanks for hanging out. Sure thing. Help with good luck, extra everyone. Questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Chris. Thank Have you. a good night, guys. Good night. Good night.